low point, really, when I stopped for good, was I had a double date with a friend. My friend uh, Cameron invited me out on a double date when I was still in this be a dick mode or be polarizing, be be challenging. And we went on a double date to the Standard Hotel here in New York City. And I was wearing this mask. And my date was this beautiful, awesome Asian woman. And during the date, I cracked a quote unquote joke that included an epithet, epithet for Asian people, which I thought was hilarious, which was greeted by dropped jaws and Arctic silence at the table. So I thought I was so polarizing and badass and funny. And I embarrassed myself. Uh, the date, my date wanted to leave. I think she, she actually did walk out. And my good buddy who wait, was trying to set me up for the night, he looked terrible. So I felt bad for everybody all around. And that was the last night I, I was wearing that mask. And a week later, I went out and said, you know what? I'm just going to go out for the night. I'm going to forget all that pickup artist bullshit. I'm just going to be really genuine with women. I'm going to be the cool, funny, witty, dorky, sweet guy from Ohio. And uh, that was one of the best nights out I'd ever had in my life. I was just so vulnerable and authentic with women. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I got to bottle this up. But first, a word from our sponsors. Promescence Delay Spray helps the dick havers last a little bit longer. Not really much else to say about that. It's pretty cut and dry. It's awesome. And if you want to enjoy an exclusive Man Whore Podcast discount, visit the link at the top of the show notes of this episode and fill your cart with their premium sexual wellness products. But hurry, you got to click that link before this deal expires on June 16th. Hotmovies.com has long been an ethical and affordable place to hashtag pay for some of your porn. Now with Hot Movies Select, customers gain access to unlimited viewings of tens of thousands of additional films from all their favorite studios for the low, low price of $24.95. Visit HotMovies.com, click Select Unlimited, and use promo code MANHOR at checkout so they know who sent you. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the Manhor Podcast. Shout out to all the fan whores, to the whoreheads, to the pod pervs, and to the lonely boys. Oh, Andrew Castertano, what's up, buddy? What, this is Billy Presida, and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. You know, I guess this episode kind of is for the lonely boys out there. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Uh, we got a stuffed up episode this week. Uh, we'll be hearing from dating coach Connell Barrett. He's got a book out now called Dating Sucks, But You Don't. And before that, we'll be hearing another state of sex work update from friend of the pod, Caitlin Bailey. She's got one woman show out that you could actually see virtually all this month. She'll be telling you more about that in a little bit. But first, you know, as I slumbered into my 32nd birthday, um, I, I attempted to go to sleep with a sincere, somewhat marijuana fueled paranoia that someone was going to cut my dick off. I'll explain. The birthday was good. Took a lot of me time. Very relaxing, you know. Nice steak dinner with dad, who, by the way, recanted his offer to let mom come when he found out that no one else was going to be in attendance. He, uh, I think he thought that my sister and my brother-in-law would be there to act as a buffer. Oops. Still nice dinner. Had a nice smoke sesh with mom. You know, it's all fine. Treated myself to an at-home massage. Shout out to Zeal. Not necessarily a sponsor, but it's kind of like the Uber of massage, and it was wonderful. Oh, my. If anybody wants to get like some credit towards their first massage, I got a link in the show notes. I hope you'll use it. You know, read my book, took a nap, did some yoga, can't really complain. And uh, my dear friend, Lucy Moon, whom some of you may recognize from, uh, from my OnlyFans content, you know, she said uh, she wanted to drive out here from her city and wake me up with a blowjob, which I think is a very nice birthday present. And we arranged, uh, in typical Billy Presida, uh risky sex fashion, we arranged for me to hide my keys in my mailbox so she could actually sneak into my bedroom and actually wake me up with her lips wrapped around my genital member. And then, in theory, sexiness would ensue. But for some reason, I was so paranoid that someone had like seen me drop the keys into the mailbox and was going to figure out 
which apartment it was and then they were going to come in and they were going to do something bad to me. And then I was like, wait a second, what if Lucy Moon is like a deep undercover agent of the people who don't like me on the internet? Oh no, oh my. What if this has all been a long con game to eventually cut my dick off? And I just wake up screaming, blood spurting, and then she's just standing there with a maniacal smile holding my severed cock going, this is for And I was like, oh no, oh my, help. <laughs> I can't explain it. It was just, that was just what was going through my head. I didn't want to think that. I wanted to fall asleep peacefully. <laughs> but instead, I was nervous that uh, the, the wrong person was going to come in and snip me or uh, the person who I've uh, grown to, to have some, uh, some fondness for and trust for was actually the Twitter deep state seeking possibly the most punitive of, uh, of justice models. <laughs> Anyway, my dick is perfectly intact. Uh, in fact, I posted some pictures of me and Lucy from that morning on my OnlyFans. Y'all should go check it out. But uh, thank you for the birthday wishes, folks. Uh, thank you for the birthday tips, birthday gifts, um, for sharing the Man Whore podcast on your social media on Main. Because as I've explained, that is the most valuable thing you can do is publicly and openly state, Hi, this is a pleasant podcast. I didn't think that's supposed to be super controversial, but apparently when you talk about gangbangs, you know, every fourth episode, people get nervous to share it. Oh, what am I going to do? Anyways, <laughs> Caitlin Bailey, she's got a new one woman show out. Uh, you know, you've heard her on the podcast several times over the years. We like having her on and we like having her, you know, update y'all about what you need to know about the legal fight to decriminalize sex work in the United States of America. We had her on pre-pandemic. We were talking about the Earn It Act, which uh, uh, luckily got killed, but is always kind of floating around out there. And she's going to let us know what to be, you know, vigilant of next. Let's go chat with Caitlin Bailey. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. That was for you later. <laughs> oh, <no>. uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fate in everybody. I'm, I'm back with Caitlin Bailey, friend of the pod from Old Pro Productions. Uh, welcome back, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me. In your bougie fucking I, Yeah, this is apartment. post The last time we talked, this was almost a construction zone. I Pro think we'd, we'd packed up. The rugs were rolled. Things there was were no lever on the wall that <laughs> emits seltzer water. <laughs> What the fuck is wrong with you? Um, but that's not what we're here. We're, we're talking about what the fuck is still wrong with America. Um, so much. <laughs> it's so much. Uh, I was hoping you could give us another. What's the state of sex work in this country these days? What's going on? Yeah, there's there's so much happening. And part of that is really scary. And a lot of it is really inspiring. Uh, just last Tuesday, um, sex workers spent over three hours testifying in front of Louisiana state legislators. Now, the bill that they were proposing, which would have fully decriminalized sex work in Louisiana, didn't get out of committee, didn't pass. But sex workers stood in front of their elected officials and made the case for full decrim in Louisiana. And I think that needs to be celebrated. Women with a vision, uh, song Southerners on New Ground. Like there are so many incredible advocates uh, working in Louisiana and they're getting heard. Um, in Oregon, there is both a legislative campaign and also uh, rumors of an upcoming potential ballot initiative mm -hmm. um, where there are advocates and um, activists are working hard to convince Oregon legislators to listen to sex workers and stop the arrests and they have they're pursuing multiple strategies to get that done um, in Vermont, Rhode Island and um, New Hampshire the sex workers have enjoyed some real legislative victories. Sex workers were included in a patient's bill of rights in New Hampshire. Um, sex workers are making progress on a study commission in Rhode Island that would radically shift the conversation. Um, and sex workers in Vermont um, had a, a legislative victory recently where they, uh, a good Samaritan law that frees up sex workers to uh, to report crimes committed against them without the, the fear or the risk of, of, being prosecuted themselves. Mm. Now, all of, none of that is full decrim. Mm. And all of that is legislators that are taking meetings uh, and listening and trying to understand the needs and concerns of sex workers as constituents and as advocates, which is a big shift from 
hunted criminal. <laughs> From like, I can't be in the same room with right. that woman. Which we like, we definitely still are. Like, sex workers are still being arrested every day. But, uh, you know, we ended loitering for the purposes of prostitution here in New York, which mm. was a huge victory led by black trans advocates. There was uh, 13 hours of testimony in D.C. where advocates from all over the country, all over the world came. I remember to- that. That was real powerful to watch online. Yes. Yeah, there was. Uh, and so I think that that in and of itself is news that mm-hmm. like there is just in in all over the country in the Gulf Coast, on the East Coast, the West Coast, uh, sex workers are being heard by their elected officials. And like, I don't know, the fact that we're just right about this is eventually going to get through to somebody. <laughs> What's so wonderful and it's got a big dumb smile on my face is the last time we talked about this on mic, it was a lot of doom and gloom. It was yeah. like, and, and I'm sure there still are, but this is the first time I'm hearing like good things yes. happen I, I, or it, things on the horizon. And like, not to be Pollyanna about this, like the, there's definitely bad news. Definitely, definitely. There always visa, is. And, and visa, <laughs> but, I mean, the, the most devastating impact that I think is, uh, you know, really impacted legal sex workers is Visa and MasterCard recently stopped uh, processing payments across erotic platforms. Mm-hmm. Now, that, of course, has had a detrimental impact on, on sex workers, whether those sex workers are criminalized or not. And I think is another indicator that like, we are actually all in the same fight and you can kind of get lost in the nitty gritty details of like what impacts who, but we are all fighting whorephobia and we are all fighting sex worker stigma. And if we change the story, then we can, we, we can change so much. We can change the laws. We can change the culture. We can, tr- we can change the way that sex workers have been treated uh, for a millennia. And do you think that having these baby wins along the way help with the stamina of that fight? I, I wouldn't just, I mean, yes, absolutely. And I, I, I think that baby- coming- wins just that like they're sitting in a room yeah. with multiple I mean we multiple sex we we had the 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 privilege of celebrating International Whores Day with the badass activists that uh you know that got themselves heard in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. The incredible coalition of, um, of of queer and black and brown advocates that have a long history of fighting an egregious um, racist police department that have, you know, the gall to go after go after sex work. I mean, I don't know if you know this history in Louisiana, but there were actually hundreds of black women that were turned away from shelters after Hurricane Katrina because they were registered sex offenders because of some prostitution charges mm-hmm. that that preceded them by decades. And that kind of miss... Uh, I don't want to call it miss... Like, I mean, like, obviously none of this should be a crime, but the racist application of the uh, more... Uh, the worst version of this law being um, being applied to communities is it, 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 it's just egregious. Yeah, and so to hear to the the heroicism of sex workers to stand up and say enough is enough, stop the arrest, to face their legislators, I think is incredible. And so we celebrated International Horse Day by coming together for a uh, you know it, buy and for sex worker exclusive party, very small affair outdoors enjoying each other's company in a pool and sharing our stories and that's the kind of stuff that doesn't make it into the history books but is the the stuff that movements are made of and it's coming together and congratulating each other for living our boldest life because none of this is easy and and 10 years ago we weren't even like saying sex worker like it was still prostitutes right yeah, yeah, 3 yeah. years ago yeah. we were at that prostituted woman which is like makes me th- <laughs> want to throw up in my mouth that was like the Ugh. best version of like well we don't want to totally blame her like she was prostituted <laughs> right, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but but like 3 years ago we were at that rally downtown mm-hmm. and like there were current elected officials there and yeah. I, I nudged you i was like can they be here yeah. and then now <laughs> now they're taking meetings they're having votes and even if those yeah. th- measures aren't passing those measures are existing and yep. isn't that incredible so yeah. you know what does the future hold sadly the future also holds doom and gloom what's Ye- on the horizon yeah no there's a lot of dangerous shit that's coming down the pipe and it's like if you think things are scary for abortion rights in this country whew, let me 
tell you about the already criminalized things. So there, there's a lot of scary bills that would uh, try to sort of further erase uh, sex work from the internet. Mm. Um, there's a lot of targeted restrictions and censorship um, that through the financial sector, so that what I was talking about before with Visa MasterCard changing their policies, these are not internal decisions that where Visa and MasterCard is like, what's a way for us to make less money? <laughs> these, are, these are in direct response to the concerns of elected officials that are equating pornographic content with exploitative content and are trying to censor um, sexual content in the name of cracking down on, uh, on you know, on child, yeah, child sexual trafficking. Yeah. And it's like a great thing that we could do to, to maybe put a dent in some child sex trafficking would be to reunite all of the children that were separated by ice with their parents. That would be like a great tangible step that we could take as a country to maybe prevent a little bit of violent child exploitation. But instead we're trying to remove titties from Instagram. A great example of, you know, legislators taking exactly the wrong move for the wrong reasons is the bill that was signed into law um, in Texas just last week mm. that crim- that raised the age of consent. In order to work at a strip club in Texas, as of last Tuesday, you could no longer be uh, being 18 and up no longer mattered. They changed it to 21 plus, which means that strippers in Texas that were 18, 19, and 20 years old Out of a job. all lost their job overnight. And like, I, you know, I'm not... It, what do you think happened, Billy? Do you <laughs> think that like their, their terrible trauma of being awfully exploited by showing their tits at a legally <laughs> licensed venue where they could work for tips... Do you do you think they feel rescued from that situation, or do you think that they're going to be pushed into full service prostitution? Mm, yeah, weird. I, do, do, I don't think they all just went and like applied to Starbucks. Yeah, no. I mean, it's like Starbucks. Uh, I don't think couldn't handle that. So I'm sorry. That's not. That's not correct. Uh, what? I, yeah. You no. Know, it's. Um, I've worked at Starbucks, yeah. and I will tell you that you cannot uh, raise a family on that. <laughs> so um, I hope not. And it it it's ter- It what baffles me so much about it is. We're signing this law and it's being hailed by on some circles of the internet as extremely feminist to recognize that women are not really adult people until their 20s, but people can still join the army at 17 and a half. So like, I don't know if it's, um, I don't get me started. Come see Horse Eye View, guys. And I, I get into all of this. That's... Before we get into Horse Eye View, um, is there, are there actions people can take who want to help, who want to be more informed? Like, what should people who are listening, they're not sex workers themselves, they sure. support sex work decrim, what can they do right now? I mean, if you want to stay more informed, I uh, highly recommend our own our own newsletter. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to be in the know like an old pro, then sign up for the old pro newsletter. Um, you can do that at oldproinc.com or the oldest profession podcast.com. Um, I would also encourage you to donate to the old pro project. You know, this is where we fund um, collective art builds in cities across the country where sex worker artists are elevating stories of sex workers within their own community. And I think that reminding elected officials across the country that sex workers have always been a part of the story might make them, I don't know, just a wee bit more hesitant to like blame the internet for the oldest profession. Uh, you know, your your uh, segue savviness has always left me in awe. <laughs> you know, it's, it's incredible. Um, <laughs> one of these things that Opro Productions is producing is your next one woman show. Yes, that is Horse correct. Horse Eye View, <laughs> which uh, is running right now all month in New York City, if I'm correct. Yes. But People can watch virtually from anywhere in the world, which I actually hate and don't want to. It's yeah, no, it, it makes me feel unsafe because like because this is and I, I I mean this kind of seriously, kind of not, but like I this is a staged reading, right? I am reading words that I hope will eventually be good. It, and this oh, is this is not, not the, this is not the final. This is not the final product. This oh. is a staged reading, so like you can tune in, but. <laughs> Why? Don't <laughs> wait for that. We want to film this as a special. We want to tour to your town. Sure. Why would you choose to see the worst possible version of this? So, like, <laughs> I, you know, come to New York and then I can, like, see your breathing body in the space and I can be like, oh, that those jokes work or those don't or this is good or, you know, they. then you have the audience feedback and, like, thank you. You sure. are doing me, the artist, a service. But, like, to zoom in from your home to watch me do 
this bad. Don't wait. Just wait. Give it a second. <laughs> if you would like, if you're just going to give me money, make a donation uh, to uh, make a donation at the old pro project. That's the better way to handle this. Don't undervalue the entertainment of uh, watching. I, as someone who has watched you alone for like an hour and a half on a stage uh, run through <laughs> stuff, uh, it is entertaining to watch you neurotically go back and try something three times. That is, that is, that, yeah, that's a, uh, I didn't realize that I always do that until three different people made fun of me for it. And I was like, oh, that's right. This is just a thing that I do. And then but you yes. apologize to the audience as if we cared. It's yeah, like, no, 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 I'm no. already in the creek in a cave alone on yeah, an yeah, afternoon yeah. Yes. watching you talk to yes. yourself. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> okay, so you, so you know what this is. And it's like, right. <laughs> right. So it's, yeah, it's me functionally alone in a room, <laughs> reading pages, pacing, and then ch- deciding that a joke. There's going to be a light cue here. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Like, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, we're yeah. going to have a block yes. and that's like representing yeah. my dad. Neurotically or like- over explaining <laughs> what could be in the future. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, do, why don't you tell people, I love, I, what is Horror's Eye View? Horror's Eye, I'm so glad that you asked. <laughs> Horror's Eye View is a, uh, it's part history lecture, part stand up special, and part very personal one woman show, you know, personal story. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a mad dash through 10,000 years of human history from a sex worker's perspective. Like a really slutty Colin Quinn special. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, where I peel back the onion of like, where does whorephobia come? From? What is this shit? Yeah. Um, and where does it come from and how does it and how can I make it about me? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure there's plenty to pick up there. But again, if people want to stay, uh, stay up to date. What do you say? Like an old pro if you want to stay. Well, how'd you phrase oh, that? Oh, yeah. If you want to be in the know like an old pro. Oh, God damn it. You are just. I'm, I'm an old brilliant. pro. You're very yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> again, it's oldproinc.com. I'll have a link in the show notes of this episode. Uh, stay vigilant. But it, again, it sounds like it sounds like we can um, still be fighting, but also celebrate a little bit and there's reason there's for progress. hope there's right. reason this for is hope. this is not a lost cause like if you were if you were holding on to your money and resources waiting for it to look like we had a path to victory then it's not too late to be an early adopter don't buy in at GameStop at 160 yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, I did yeah, yeah. you know it's like <laughs> don't be <laughs> this is right now this is like when GameStop was 35 and we all thought that was nuts see you yeah, know you gotta you go. get in now because <laughs> sex work decrims going to the moon <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caitlin, uh, thank you again for chatting with us and updating about us about the state of sex work and horrors I view. Even even if you're insisting, no one watches it. Um, I, don't. <laughs> uh, I still think uh, there's value to check it out, and uh, and it's it's great seeing you again. And uh, why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody? Bye, y'all. Thanks for. Uh Thanks for listening to Sex Workers. Uh, I want to do a real quick fan whore appreciation moment. Yep. I want to give a shout out right now to the uh, the beautiful, the gorgeous, the wonderfully cocksucking Lucy Moon. Yeah, Lucy doesn't only make OnlyFans content with me. For some reason, she insists upon supporting this podcast on Patreon, and you should too. The best way to support me and the Man Whore podcast, which are the same person, basically, because uh, corporations are people. There's another thing that you should call people about. Uh, <laughs> uh, folks, the best way you can support me in what I am doing week in and week out is to become a member of my Fan Whore community on Patreon. That is the most direct and helpful way uh, you can support and fund uh, me doing what it is I'm doing, and you receive a slew of great rewards. Personally, I know that Lucy uh, joined up on Patreon because she wanted to join the peep show. She wanted a nice, fun, positive, happy, supportive environment to also share some fire nudes. And we'd love to see you in there, too. So, again, best way to support the podcast, join up on Patreon at patreon.com slash Podcast. The second best way you can support me and what I'm doing is by following me on OnlyFans. It's free to follow. And I keep it pretty affordable to have some fun. Not to mention you can catch me and Lucent having all sorts of naked good times at OnlyFans.com slash Call Me Billy. I'll, I'll spoiler alert. It's very average. It's not huge. Yeah, I don't understand why everyone else is following it either. You know, you, you would think, oh, okay, I get, man, yeah, he's kind of funny and... You know, okay, the blue eyes. I I get the, with the blue eyes, but it's it's got he's got to have at least eight inches. No, no, pretty pretty normal, everyone. Uh, and the third best way to support the Man Whore Podcast, uh, you know, apparently buy me a shower curtain. Thank you to Jess uh, from Canada for that. It matches the bathroom aesthetic very nicely. Uh, we, we we like gifts over here. We like gifts. <laughs> 
And now for Connell Barrett. Uh, Connell Barrett, he is a dating coach. This podcast episode, we have attempted like at least three times. We've had multiple technical difficulties. So we finally waited till he got his shot in the arm. And then I went over to his apartment. We had a fantastic recording. It was really great getting to know this guy. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, the, look, Connell is a dating coach. And he's a dating coach primarily for men who want to date women. He preaches things like confidence and authenticity. And honestly, I really don't think those things are gendered. And I, you know, I can't say that I agree 100% with such generalizations. I think the things that Connell teaches, however, can be applied by anyone of any gender who wants to be more confident, who wants to be more assertive in their dating life. It's, I mean, honestly, his tips really can work for anyone who wants to feel, uh, you know, who wants to feel strong enough to walk up to someone that they think are cute and say, hi, my name is blank, you're purdy. So I just want to give that little disclaimer up top. There's a lot of like women this, men that, he, she, this, and I'm just reminding y'all that like, yo, I think this is applicable to all of y'all. Unless you're a princess, and a princess is a is an agender term. That's just someone who is uh, waiting for some sort of agendered prince to show up and uh, take them out for dinner. Folks, Connell Barrett, the book is Dating Sucks But You Don't. Let's go get confident, hey. When I first started paying for porn, probably my junior year of college, one of the things I noticed was like, wow, this site is great, but it's $20 a month and it only gives me this. And I was thinking, wow, do people have to like put together and hodgepodge a bunch of different expensive porn site memberships just to get a nut off? That sounds pricey. And that's why HotMovies.com is now introducing their select unlimited subscription model. HotMovies.com licenses content from Erbuddy. Oh, did that feel uncomfortable hearing me say Erbuddy? I'm I'm sorry, guys. Oh, gosh. You know, Nelly was big uh, in, when I was in high school. HotMovies.com is a longtime sponsor of the Man Whore Podcast. And a great way to support the Man Whore Podcast is to support the brands who support me. And they want you to enjoy it with their select unlimited monthly subscription service for just $24.95 a month. You'll never be bored at HotMovies.com. And use promo code MANWHORE when you sign up so they know who sent you. One more time, hotmovies.com, promo code MANHOR. Folks, your special MANHOR podcast deal with Promescent is running out fast. This is my last chance to tell you that you can get 15% off any of Promescent's premium sexual wellness products, including their flagship product, their Delay Spray, the spray that gives penis havers the confidence to last a little longer in bed. There's no shame in it. It's just a tool in your toolkit, just like the cock ring and the vibrator. You're going to want to have your delay spray there too. To get 15% off at Promescent.com, go to the link in my show notes. It will apply your code automatically so you can shop and save. So again, go to the link in the show notes so you can enjoy some more goodness from Promescent. Now let's get to the show. Gotcha. It's like that gum commercial. Have you seen the gum commercial? I it went not. viral. I forget the name of the gum, which means their marketing isn't as good as they think it is, but it's a great commercial because <laughs> I forget the name of the gum. I think it might be free. Anyway, it's uh just Google orgy gum commercial. Orgy. See well, it's a, up. it's a PG rated orgy and it's, it's a two and a half minute commercial for gum that went viral. And basically it's, Hey, the world is back to normal. We can, we can be with each other again. Mm. And people are making out in trees and falling and making out in boats and falling into the water and Celine Dion's It's All Coming Back to Me Now is playing, which is what makes the commercial. <laughs> uh, and what you're describing is an X-rated version of that commercial. <laughs> but So what I want to know is, was Celine Dion there at the party performing? She was not there, and they were also not playing any Celine, and I really wish they were. <laughs> I really wish they were, <laughs> but that's a good time to say uh, I'm chatting right now with the the Celine Dion fan club leader, Connell Barrett. Everybody, I own that. I love <laughs> it's all coming back to me. <laughs> uh, Thanks for having me on, Billy. <laughs> Finally, this is a podcast. Uh, many months, three in the months making. in the making, multiple attempts. 
in a world where podcasts cannot happen because of technical difficulties. Our email thread is so long. <laughs> How long is it? I'm going, it's so long. No, I'm not. I'm not going to make one of those. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad we can finally try this again. And I hope it fucking works. <laughs> is the lens cap on the microphone? Because that'll fuck it all up. How, if, if at the end of this, I fucked up again, I will quit my job. I will write a resignation letter to myself. The first time, I forget, it was some kind of a tech thing. The second time, I dropped off gear. And then when I went home and recorded, my shit wasn't working right. Mm. And then when I got working right, batteries were dead. And I was like, dude, I, my brain's frazzled. So, Well, you, this is a born-again virgin <laughs> moment for me because this is the first in-person podcast I've done post-COVID. Yeah. And I'm psyched. And I feel like we're all going through this like doing things doing things we've done before for the first time again or it feels like the first it feels like the first time uh so this is my first in real life podcast in our in the after times and like what kind of a gift moment like in this moment in time like what kind of gift that is that you can experience something you've done plenty of times for the first time that does not normally happen yeah i think it's this beautiful thing that we can kind of all experience uh with certain activities i my birthday was seven days ago and I kissed my dad on the cheek and it was so simple a simple thing I've done with my parents a million times but post COVID it was like I'm kissing my dad on my cheek I was like started to cry he had this big grin on his face and my dad is a midwestern guy from Ohio who's not gonna cry or get emotional but he was like all rosy cheeked it was beautiful yeah it's 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 really cool and then the idea of like dating again is just like get, getting on in-person dates that's a thing right now a lot of people I think are nervous about they're nervous about what to do with whom to do um you know how do i talk to per people on a date again yeah uh there's even the whole thing of like if you've done a lot of inner work it's like how do i date now with this new understanding of myself maybe you've like um maybe you've raised a bar in your mind of what yeah. you're gonna accept and not accept and now you have to actually enact all this stuff that you journaled about so i think uh so, for so many reasons so many different types of people are are going into like a new world with the uh, with with dating. Uh, yeah, I've been dating a lot since I got vaccinated about 6 weeks ago and became fully vaxxed. And what I've found is that I'm a I'm a better listener than I was 18 months ago. I think all of that zooming, there's like a wax on, wax off all along Mr. Miyagi was teaching us to be more present and better listeners. Zoom, FaceTime, it's made us actually listen to people. And on my first few dates, granted the first one there wasn't any chemistry but but after that all of a sudden i really connected quickly with these women and i feel like part of it is because i've had so many fucking zoom and facetimes that i can listen to every single syllable and really be present with her which is attractive which well, well, and, also, connecting, and connecting yeah well we also get good at that because we learn oh if we try to talk over each other with the lag it's a fucking mess <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, i'm not jumping in and trying to cut them off like i not that i would do that on purpose but men can do that sometimes and so far so good and i think that for people listening to this who are thinking okay back to get out into the dating world you might surprise yourself that you're gonna be better than you might think mm. two things i would focus on is what i focused on on my first date i just said hey as soon as i walk into that that bar uh the other room on perry street and she walked in. I said, hey, this is a win. I'm back in the real world talking to a human without masks this on. This is how I felt at the first sex party. I was like, <laughs> I talked to myself. I was like, I'm going to go have fun. These are what my expectations are or yeah. not. I feel cute today. Let's just be happy to be there. <laughs> totally. A cheat code to confidence is give yourself goals that are completely in your control. I walk in. I feel good. I dress well, a cool spot. Hey, mm -hmm. it's a good date. I'm going to feel confident, which gives you a chance to have the better quote unquote result. And I'm a big believer in giving yourself easy guaranteed wins because mm -hmm. they feel good and they make you just get a little swagger, get a little vibe going. And before you know it, you kind of have that kind of the Kavorka, as Kramer would call it. <laughs> yeah. And, and as white guys, I mean, the bar is so low, we can trip over it every day. And I just hope for everyone to have that type of easy expectation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like for a play party, I set the expectation that I want to try to, I would like to make out with someone new or I'd like mm. to have a really good make out session. Anything else is bonus. Nice. Right. We've kept it easy. It, if I had to set the bar, I got to fuck three women and I got to put right. my penis in their vaginas and i gotta be hard for them i gotta come that's 
that's a that's a tall bar to clear. Even yeah. for the sport fuckers, that can be a tall bar a uh, bar to clear. Uh, going on a date, it's the same thing. I'm like, if I make out with this woman, we connect. Great. I don't need to try to have sex with the first date. It's like, why are we going to set this bar up here? Totally. If it happens, that's great. Yeah. But if it doesn't, I wasn't expecting it anyway. Yeah, yeah. I once had a first date with a gorgeous woman, like Julia Roberts lookalike. Mm. And I gave myself very low bar for the first date. And my mantra is make it about going for it. Mm. Assert what you want within reason and you know, make it make it something that's win-win. So I said to myself, I'm going to put a big smile on her face. I'm going to try to make her laugh, make her smile, and go for that kiss if and when I see the moment. And... I followed that, and this was a big break- breakthrough for me because I wasn't trying to get in her pants. I wasn't trying to make anything sexual happen, and I, that relaxed me, and we were able to connect better, and this window, this first makeout window opened, and I leaned in. It was really sexy and smooth, and we kissed and ended up going back to her place, and we did end up hooking up that night, not because I was trying to lead it there, but because it happened organically. She took my hand from her patio and, and ushered me into the bedroom after we were making out on her patio. And I thought, that's nice. <laughs> when she, Is it she's nice so into it, she's leading me there. Mm. And it all started with a low bar on that first date. I'm just going to go for the kiss if I see the window open. And that led to a really <laughs> romantic, amazing night. A b- romantic, amazing night in her bedroom. I can't imagine what happened. Did yeah. y'all just cuddle and talk about roses i mean <laughs> yeah we she gave me a foot rub and then we did taxes basically did taxes. yeah okay that's exactly. hot yeah they're, they're, I, I have my own kinks it's just funny because i have patreon members who are accountants and i think actually would find that very actuarially <laughs> hot <laughs> so uh but <laughs> but yeah are you noticing anything on your dates uh where you're like ooh, there's either a new problem that wasn't there pre-covid no other than getting a bit in your head for the first one or two dates back, yeah, I, I definitely was a little bit in my head on that first date. But but and we didn't we were, we weren't mutually attracted to each other the first date, so it was uh-huh. sort of a friendly hug, good night, and I was just happy to have gone out and had a con- a, a really good intellectual conversation. And you still went on another day after, that. not with her. Oh, okay, we only okay. had it, I yeah, it was a situation where where her the the her who showed up didn't quite look like the her who I envisioned from the profile. Okay. It's not to say she was using inaccurate photos. It's just I had an idea in my mind of what the vibe was going to be that wasn't there. But but the second date I had, I was a little in my head because I had to go for a kiss for the first time in 18 months. And like Mr. Dating Coach, Mr. Ego, it's like, oh no, what if I forget how? Mm-hmm. What if she doesn't want to kiss me? Am I going to go 0 for 2? Because, um, you know, as a dating coach or, any, or as any man, there's this whole kind of ego you know, it's like I want I want her to kiss me back. So I, as a dating coach, I mean, the bar whether you want it to be or not is raised a little bit. I gotta imagine the expectations are a little different. You know, like I I get nervous if I hook up with someone who has an expectation of me sexually based on the fact that I talk about sex for a living. Yeah, because I'm like, well, let's not let's not raise the bar on this dick too high. Like let's <laughs> like again, let's keep it low. I might suck. <laughs> right. Under promise, over deliver. Right. I'm a big fan of that. Again, that's smart. It's the white man mantra. It's yeah. under promise, over deliver. Yeah. Try not to cause too much harm. It's Joe Biden's uh, unofficial uh, slogan, I think. That was exactly. That's what he ran on. And he yeah. won. Uh, so. Essentially. No, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. So my second date was with this really cool uh, Polish American woman. And we went out for drinks. And of course, that included dinner because at the time food was required. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting next to her in the this cocktail lounge and thinking, oh man, I got to make a move. What do I do? So what I did is I coached myself the same way I coach my guys. I told myself, it's okay to be afraid. It's been 18 months. If you're not a little afraid, there's something wrong with you. And I remember it it wasn't even a kiss. It was just hold her hand. Because I believe in baby stepping to the first kiss. Mm -hmm. I like to have some signals from women. If I go to hold her hand and she Mm -hmm. holds it back, that's a really nice signal that, okay, then we'll soon be ready to kiss. And the handhold was scarier than the first kiss because what if she doesn't want me to take her hand? What if she pulls it back? Mm-hmm. And all that inner dialogue that men and women deal with. So went for the went for the handhold just through courage. Not that that takes, it's not exactly storming Normandy to show that kind of courage, but went, took her hand, she took it back. 10 minutes later, we had a really nice kiss. And I thought, yeah back in the game felt good and that's another 
that sort of Zen Buddhism idea of being f- detached from an outcome. You want to go for an outcome on a date or in a relationship, but at the same time, the paradox is you want to be relatively detached from whether it happens. That's why I'm all about going for the the action, the process, going for the kiss, mm-hmm. or going for the compliment, or trying to assert in a win-win way what energy I'd like to project toward her, because I know if she receives it and enjoys it, I'm going to get that energy back, but if I don't get it, I'm not married to that outcome. I might be bummed if a beautiful woman yeah. doesn't want to make out with me. I had a, I had a, my third or fourth date back post-COVID was with a, pardon the redundancy, beautiful, gorgeous model. Uh, and I was really psyched. My dating coach ego was all puffed up walking into my first date with a, a total um, professional, stunning woman. And uh, she just wasn't that into me. Mm. You know, whatever blueprint she had, whatever she wanted. Can you whatever. sense that during the days that's something you don't figure out till the very end? I could sense. I could sense it, mm. but it actually became clear to me one night later. Mm. Here's why. So on my date with the model, I'll call her Cassie, which is not her real name, but close to it. With Cassie, I remember thinking, oh, she's not feeling what I want her to feel. What dating coach judo moves can I use? And I have some. Yeah. And I probably was a little choppy and, and, and uh, uh, there's, some, there's still some, at the time, there was still some cobwebs on the golf clubs. And, you know, walked her home. I could just kind of tell nothing was going to quote unquote work. Mm-hmm. And then the very next night, I had a, a date with a different woman. Super cute, cool, not a model, but an awesome woman. <laughs> Uh, and like within five minutes, the way she looked at me, I could see, oh, this woman's into me Mm -hmm. and I'm into her. I find her attractive. I'm I'm here. I'm present. I'm enjoying it. And I felt like I was the same guy both nights. So I looked back over both nights and I thought, you know what? I didn't do anything wrong that first night. If anything, we just didn't have that chemistry, that mutual chemistry that has to be there. And there's some things that you can't coach into existence. Sometimes there's either chemistry or there's not, and uh, that's okay. So I didn't take it personally. Uh, as I tell my clients, if a beautiful woman, woman blows you off, doesn't mean you're unworthy of beautiful, amazing woman, mm-hmm. women. It just means not this that one. one. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not a, it's just not a fit. And that's, I mean, look, I've, I've been on dates where I was like, oh, no, there was something up. There were things that I would, there was feedback I would give. But the other times I've I've, I've said I, I don't think I'm feeling for another date because I was like there's nothing wrong with you I'm just not feeling that fit and that's not that means there's nothing wrong with either of us it just means us would be wrong yeah that's all totally it, it, it doesn't have to be a whole you know uh, blow to an ego absolutely absolutely uh, wh- where do you, where do you pick up this shit <laughs> where like where where do you uh, find your dating philosophies oh over time I'm like a Frankenstein monster of dating philosophies that has led to my current philosophy. I I was more or less dateless in high school and college. And in my 20s, I, I barely dated. I married the first woman who I felt was really wanted me. And then she dumped I, me. I believe it was a, it was a nine month relationship. If I if I have my notes correct, <laughs> uh, I wish it was nine months. It was nine oh. week marriage. Oh oh, it was a long it was a long relationship. It was a five year oh, relationship, okay. but the marriage was nine weeks. Oh my. And we fought for custody of the wedding cake. That's how <laughs> quick it was over. Thank you. I wish I had a rim shot I could do in my, <laughs> here in my apartment. But uh, so when she left me, justifiably, she was settling. I was settling. Neither of us wanted to get married. Mm-hmm. That you weren't a dating coach no, back then. No, though, right? I was. I she was the second woman I'd ever even kissed. Yeah. And I just I never developed the dating romantic confidence side of myself. So after she left me and then a couple of years passed off and on loneliness, sadness, wanting to approach women here in New York City, I finally said, you know what? I need help. I need a coach. So what I did is I started literally traveling the world, working with cool, classy coaches, totally sketchy pickup artists, mm. uh, hypnotists, self-help coaches who aren't even about dating, just Hypnotist general. for hypnotizing yourself, not the not her, right? <laughs> yes. For, just for making me. sure. <laughs> yes, exactly. No, I, so I go on a date and I hold a gold watch and I say, <laughs> you're getting very horny right now. <laughs> no, I went to a hypnotist to try to get over approach anxiety, sure. approaching the anxiety you feel when you want to approach a woman. And so my philosophy came from trying anything and everything under the sun within reason from all these various coaches. And I, over the co- course of several years, I learned what worked for me, what didn't. I saw what worked for other guys and what didn't. I, I watched my coaches and just a ton of trial and error. 
And then I, my big aha moment in terms of what works is I had a, a very sketchy <laughs> pickup artist coach. He was even in Time Magazine. Time Magazine. Are you able to say which, which one of the I'll let PUAs people was? Google it if they want to. Okay. Uh, but Time Magazine asked the question, is he the most hated man in America? And he was coaching me at the time. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> um, because he got into some hot water with social media. Anyway, he and, and, and a couple other coaches gave me the advice, and they said, basically, Connell, you're too nice. Women, you're just a doormat. You need to be a badass. You need to be alpha. You need to be a, a little bit of a dick. Go out for a month and just be a dick to women. That was his advice. And I thought, okay, he's the expert. I mean, I'll do what my coach wants. And and I read about this in the book. I read about how how a big turning point moment for me was going out for about 10 or 11 days doing this, mm -hmm. and it felt awful. I felt like I was wearing an ill-fitting suit. Uh, I, I would like women would be dancing at the bar and I would, I would like wa wag my finger at them saying no dancing, no dancing at the bar. And they looked at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? Who are you? Uh, <laughs> that's just so not me. And I would do, I would just, I would say shocking, polarizing things. Uh, the low point really when I stopped for good was, what'd you say about Israel, Palestine? I, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, was that you being bad boy? No. Okay. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, all those Palestinians <laughs> have all the right ideas. Uh, and so I had a double date with a friend. My friend uh, Cameron invited me out on a double date when I was still in this be a dick mode or be polarizing, be be challenging. And we went on a double date to the Standard Hotel here in New York City. And I was wearing this mask. And my date was this beautiful, awesome Asian woman. Mm. Really sweet. I mean, I, I didn't get to know her well, but she seemed really sweet. And during the date, I cracked a quote unquote joke that included an epithet, epithet for Asian people, which okay. I thought was hilarious, which was greeted by dropped jaws and Arctic silence at the table. So I thought I was so polarizing and badass and funny. And I embarrassed myself. Uh, the date, my date wanted to leave. I think she, she actually did walk out. And my good buddy who went, was trying to set me up for the night, his, he looked terrible because he was relating. He was connected to me. So I felt bad for everybody all around. And that was the last night I, I was wearing that mask. And a week later, I went out and said, you know what? I'm just going to go out for the night. I'm going to forget all that pickup artist bullshit. I'm just going to be really genuine with women. I'm going to be the cool, funny, witty, dorky, sweet guy from Ohio. And uh, that was one of the best nights out I'd ever had in my life. I was just so vulnerable and authentic with women. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I got to bottle this up and learn how to help men do this. Because it didn't just work that night, it kept working and working, and I just felt better and better about myself. So my philosophy, what I call radical authenticity, is about dropping all the games, all the bullshit, learning how to channel your true best self in a way that is still confident and cool, but also genuine in, who, in you, whoever you are, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Absolutely. Growing up, and, and again, we both... Uh, it's fine. I have to. I have to actually go hear, listen back to see if the audio we did do worked up until the point of the last time, right? Because I think we talked a lot about this then. Where we have a similar background, in as much as we both lacked a lot of confidence, we both really didn't know how to talk to women. We had very minimal, if any, like experience. Up, you know, up until I know for me it was college. I think you said your twenties, right? And like people would frustratingly give me advice all the time. People wanted to help. Uh, a lot of girls wanted to help. Like, you know, when you're in high school, I'm like, the, the chick friends wanted to help out, but none of them actually wanted to make out with me. I'm like, would this right. work on you? Well, like, not with me. I mean, do this with someone else. Uh, no, but, <laughs> um, but, but they wouldn't work because the people would give me advice of what worked for them. But yeah. that, what works for them isn't going to work for Billy. There is a Billy way to do it. Right. And I had to find that. And it may have elements that a lot of people use, but there's a certain combination of all the elements that works for Billy Presida. It was like any time I was at like a dance or even in college when I still was able to talk to women and they said, yeah, you just go up to a girl and you start grinding with her. That always felt – anytime I tried to do it, it felt like this is not me. This is not me doing this thing right now. Even when it worked, it didn't feel like me. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean there's a type of guy out there who's probably really comfortable and confident with the – the grinding approach move on the dance floor 
that's certainly not me as well. I mean, I'm not a physical person so much. I'm a very verbal person, as yeah. are you, I assume. You host a podcast. Yeah, well, right? I, I assume that I just always, the reason why I, I think I'm a verbal person is I assume that when they look at me, they weren't going to be into it, but I can talk that I can show them my other attributes through words. So I was just yeah. like, so like growing up like a chubby kid, you go like, well, I have to be good with words because I can't just show up and have them interested. Which, by the way, I, which I learned in the last couple of play parties, I, I I actually can. I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my fucking life. I had I had women following me out the party to give me a number. Nice. Because yeah. I was carrying myself in the most confident way I've ever yeah. had in my entire life. I'm so glad you said that because yeah. the whole looks thing is such an issue for men, right? Got to be a, have six-pack abs or tall or an awesome jaw or whatever it is. I've got to be amazing looking. And there's a self-fulfilling prophecy that kicks in where if you think you are great looking, then you're going to carry yourself with confidence and take certain actions. Guess what? Women are not going for the looks. They're going for the confidence and the the actions are opening possibilities. So a guy who is a little bit overweight or shorter than average or just he's just not Brad Pitt. He's more Brad Garrett. That guy doesn't take the actions to meet the women he wants. And when if he does, he's not sure as hell not feeling relaxed and loose and unstifled and just totally chill. He's, uh, am I going to get rejected and be shown that I'm ugly to women? Uh, so, so yeah, one of, one of the guys who used to coach me, his name is Owen Cook. Mm. He's, he's in the book, The Game. He's probably approached more women than anybody on the planet, if that, even though that's not a knowable thing. I, wouldn't, I would be surprised if anybody... Sounds tiring. It's he's probably why he doesn't do it anymore. But he was my main approaching mentor back in the day. And he's a five foot eight chubby ginger with a balding head and a big, weird, bushy beard. Nobody looks at Owen and says, wow, what a hot guy. And I saw him do super heroic things that really showed me, oh, it's not about looks. Sure, it's a nice bonus, right? Mm -hmm. If you got good looks, it's like having a jacuzzi. Nice to have, overrated. Women aren't going to go home with you just because you're good looking. Uh, They're going to go home with you because they feel a connection to you some kind of connection, even just a low level connection of, yeah, cool guy. We can hook up for the night. There's still got to be some kind of comfort and connection there. And the other thing they have to see is value. They have to see there's some value this guy brings to my life, some value that's relevant to her, whether she wants a boyfriend or a makeout or a hookup at a play party or all the above or something else. She's got to see that value. So what I try to help guys do and what I had to learn is how do I raise my value? How do I become that high value guy in an authentic way? And also be confident in who I am and uh, that those things aren't, those things aren't easy to do, but once you do them, then you've effectively cracked the code of quote unquote, getting the girls. Yeah. Well, when was your turning point in confidence? When did you finally realize I'm a confident guy? Two levels to this. One is I basically went through two levels of learn, getting really good at dating. First level was online dating. Mm. I got really good at online dating uh, first. So I got plenty of dates. So I, start, I mean, it took me time. I had to test a lot of different profiles and photos and use different apps and different platforms. But once I kind of figured out how this works, I realized, whoa, I can go from basically dateless to three, four, or five dates a week. And then I learned good first date game for lack of a better term. So I felt really confident when I had three dates and three nights from online dating and made out with all three girls. And all of a sudden I had like a little bit of a rotation on my hands, which I'd never had before. So all of a sudden you start feels weird, right? Feels It feels <laughs> wonderful and weird, a little bit unsteady, yeah. but, but mostly good, but like sort of like, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. But now you're like, how do I do the juggling? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the juggling yeah, that, 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 that was an issue at the time as well. So with, with online dating, I all of a sudden I got lots and lots of dates online. But what I really wanted to do living in New York City is just be out in the world walking up to women when so inspired and saying hi to that gorgeous woman at the at Starbucks or be at a club or a bar and be able to talk to a woman in real life. So I had situational confidence. Mm. Put me on an app, put me on a dating uh, platform, and boom, I could get a couple dates. And you can live and love that way. You don't need to approach women if you don't want to. Mm. But what I wanted was kind of the freedom to to meet women anywhere. Because something Owen said to me once, he said it in a seminar, but it really resonated with me. He said, until you can walk up to any woman, chat, be your true self, and, and make something happen, there's room to grow. 
as, as a man, as a straight man. Mm. Uh, and I, that really resonated with me. And that was something I'd never done before. So the second level of realizing I'd gotten good with girls took it a lot longer. It was approaching. Mm. It was meeting women in real life. Okay. C- continue. Yeah. Look, I, I have a thought, but I'll, I'll, I want to hear more about the second level. Okay. And then I'll, I'll say what I'm catching on to. Okay. So the so when I went out to approach women again, I'm sorry, to approach women, it felt like day one of let's get of let's figure out dating. All of the situational online dating success I had with all these dates and hookups and everything, that all was not present of mind. Something about approaching, I, I did not have I did not have situational confidence. I would walk into that well, the first night I ever walked into a rooftop bar, it's the opening vignette of my book on chapter one, uh, before I even walked out on the rooftop. I was in the men's room stall with dry heaves because I was so wow. nervous. I was so nervous. I hope you had the Altoids with you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I did have mints. I remember I, do, I did have mints. I, I came fully equipped because I was just so nervous about approaching women. Now, what was I really nervous about? What is any guy really nervous about when he approaches a woman? It's not rejection. It's what his interpreta- interpretation of rejection would mean. And in my mind... Those old stories, those old wounds from years ago, I was afraid that, oh, I'm going to approach, women aren't going to like me, and that's going to make me feel like that insignificant, unattractive loser, even though I had all this other evidence from online dating, but I didn't have that approaching evidence. So that first night, I went out, and I met this incredible woman named Kelly, beautiful blonde actress, aspiring actress, like a lot of them. I don't know if she was working or not, but (laughs) gorgeous woman. We were clicking, we were bonding, we were connecting, and I <laughs> I went to get us drinks, came back. We hadn't kissed or anything yet, but we ha- were having a great bond mm. on this rooftop bar in the city in 2009. I get back with our drinks, and she's ringed by these three Wall Street guys. This, I've, I've been there. And this cool, guys. this cool, tall, wavy-haired guy in the middle was like, she, she was twirling her hair and like really into their attention. And of course, I get back and think, oh, well, I'll just come back and, you know, give her, the, give her her drink and we'll be on our way. And I gave her the drink and she didn't even look at me. She just took the drink and kept talking to the cool, wavy-haired guy and his two wingmen who proceeded to like box me out. And kind of like I couldn't even get in. What's fucked up is I bet you they've practiced that. They've like, you know, they've met about the fantasy football draft and we're like, okay, let's do that. Let's run the play for when the guy comes back with the drinks. You two do the elbows. Okay. And then I, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's it like, that orchestrated. It felt that way. So, so I went from being her date to her waiter. Here's your drink, miss. You go ahead and hook up with this guy, even though uh, you were with me. And I kind of walked away, shoulders slumped. But what she didn't know is I had my coach with me that night. Because I was on the first night of a boot camp where you go out and approach women, and I had a coach. So I went to him and I said, hey, what do I do? This, I told him the situation. These guys are stealing my girl. She seems to be more into him than me. What do I do? Do I do some cool like... This is at the bar? Yes, this is on the rooftop bar. Does 15, she notice that you've gone off to talk to your coach? She's No, she's focused on Mr. Wavy Hair. Okay. And... And I go to him and, and I, I, I tell him the situation. I say, do I say some, do I do some cool line? Do I neutralize what's called the AMOG, the alpha male of the group? It's a term from the book, The Game. I'd okay. read all this pickup theory stuff. He's, do I say, do I go back in? Do I flirt with other girls in front of her? Do I do, what do I do? And he said, well, if she's your girlfriend, what would you do? And I said, I'd go take her away from them. I'd say, this is not cool. You're with me. What the fuck? He's like, cool, go do that. Go take her away from, go take her away. I'm like, what? What do you mean? I barely know. He's like, do you want her? She's either going home with her, t- with you tonight or with him. Who do you want it to be? And I said, all right. And he got me all kind of psyched up and I charged over there. 17 year old me, by the way, is pissing his pants. <laughs> <laughs> I was not, ironically. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was feeling some nerves, but I got kind of all psyched up and I got, I felt like, yeah, you know what? It's not like we were to get, she and I were chatting for a good hour. I hadn't just met her. It, it was a solid hour of like us, yeah. right? I wouldn't do this to somebody who I'd never even met, yeah. but she was, she was with me. We exchanged numbers, talked about a date, and now she's drinking the drink I bought with a cool, handsome investment wanker, the kind of guy who's always gotten the girls that I'd wanted. And I'm like, fuck this shit. It's time to, it's time to change this story or at least try. And I marched over there. And I, I took her firmly by the wrist and I said, come with me now and pulled her away. And I heard her say, bye guys, as I pulled her away and took her maybe 10, 12 feet away over to a bench. The investment 
banker guys just kind of were standing there and they, they did nothing. And I sat her down and I said, and I remember what my coach said. He said, when in doubt, just, just say what you're thinking and feeling, speak your deepest truth. And I looked at her and said, Kelly, I think you're cool. You're sexy. You're soulful, but it's just not cool for you to flirt with other guys in front of me. And then she like kind of like leaned in and like kind of twirled her hair and smiled a little bit and said, you just stole me away from those guys. Like, like you own me. And she was, and I was like, holy shit, this is turning her on. <laughs> I hate her. <laughs> <This> and, <one. laughs> but her, her, her words were, I'm not yours yet, but her, she was starting to lean toward me. And I said, I don't own you. I don't even know you, but I really want to get to know, know you. And then I said something I can't believe came out of my mouth in the moment. I said, and when I want something, I go after it which is totally not true <laughs> at the time, but it was in that moment. Yeah. And then I, until that moment, I'd never made a woman swoon before. She just kind of went, ah. And I leaned in and she leaned in and we made out and we were together the rest of the night. And she came back here um, to this room where we are right now, yeah. my apartment. And we were in that bed the next morning and this is how my first chapter ends. And I was like, my head was swimming. I actually poked her on the shoulder while she slept to make sure she was really there. I was like, did this happen? Yeah. Did I walk into a bar last night having never approached a woman in my life and bring home the cutest blonde <laughs> girl there? I, I think she was. And I just remember thinking, wow, if this is possible, what else is possible? Like, who am I really? Did you lack that kind of confidence in other aspects of your life besides dating? No, absolutely mm -hmm. not. I Don't get me wrong. There are other areas I needed to work on, uh -huh. but... I had a really kick-ass job as, as a magazine editor and writer at the time, which at the time was you a dream. You kept the glasses. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, exactly. These are, these are very magazine editor glasses. Yes, <laughs> yes. These are my author glasses. <laughs> these are my I'm really smart glasses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Elton John designed these for me. Yeah. They're huge. Um, so I, at the time, I was a had a good magazine job. I had a cool circle of friends, uh, pretty good at some sports. Had a, you know, I had a great really great life. So my life felt really out of balance because I had this one area where I was really behind and just uh, like I was like a bicycle tire with one broken spoke, mm -hmm. which was women and dating. It's just like there was no confidence there. Everything else was pretty strong. Yeah. And I mean, my fitness wasn't amazing, but I was relatively fit. So my theory and what I've, what I've kind of, what a lot of what this book is about what I, and what I coach guys in is I basically, I basically realized that there are, we all basically have two selves right? We have what I call a lower self and a higher self. And that higher self, any area of your life where you're just crushing it, you feel really genuine, present, confident, authentic, fulfilled. Your higher self is being activated. All of these human needs we all have are kind of operating at top capacity, four or five bars of service. Any area of your life where you're not confident, where you're suffering, where you're not engaged, your lower self is running the show. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that you can basically kind of rewire your psychology and take what, take the areas of, take, take the guy, this higher self superhero who is crushing it at work or crushing it at the gym or really connected and, and just loves his friends and is Mr. Social. You can put that guy in charge of your dating life because mm -hmm. that guy doesn't need that many techniques. He needs a, a, a lot of confidence, a little bit of technique, and just a, a massive amount of self-belief and, and enjoyment of the process. So what I did with um, Kelly that night, if you think about it, there wasn't any real fancy technique. Mm -hmm. We just chatted. She liked my kind of dorky, nerdy writer self, but then I had to step up and really do something courageous and yeah. scary at the time, and that takes a higher version of ourselves to do that kind of thing. I'm not. Most guys don't need to do something that dramatic. Yeah, and you also just generally don't, you don't, you don't want to generally just grab women by the wrist and just drag them around places. No, like, no, you should quick, grab quick, any quick. woman, any woman. No, no, <laughs> definitely not. Disclaimer. Uh, no. The context is so important, right? Yeah. She and I had been chatting for an hour. You hadn't just met her, all that stuff. And, right. You know, we were so, kind of vibing as kind of a couple. And and you know what? She might have like pulled her arm back and said, fuck off. Right. But she like let me kind of take her over. Mm -hmm. She let me kind of pull her away. And all right, where is this going to go? Sure. You just took me away from those guys, she said, twirling her hair yeah. and smiling at me. So she liked it. Uh, and um, again, that's, that's actually a way more dramatic situation than arises in most approaching situations. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned in doing this for 10 years is there's always some moment of truth. 
in the courtship attraction phase. Maybe not that dramatic, maybe not stealing her away from wavy hair investment banker, but there are moments of truth where it's like, oh man, I gotta go for that first kiss or else I'm gonna lose her. Mm-hmm. Or I've gotta say the honest thing. I've gotta take some kind of risk. So there's always, almost always some kind of moment of truth that will essentially decide, determine whether or not you and she are gonna really connect romantically or eh, it's just gonna kinda go away. Yeah, and then what's the point that you you go and say, okay, I've now got it down so good. I'm going to be a dating coach. Also, can yeah. you help define a dating coach and maybe separate from some of these other things that are out there, especially, which, and I and I think I told this to you last time I've said, ah, I'm always very skeptical of the dating coach guy because uh, <laughs> it always seems like a few steps away from the pickup artist guy. Right. So it, maybe if you want to help to, uh, separate those two for a listener. Yeah. So the difference between me and a pickup artist is simply intention. Pickup artists teach some, teach some badass stuff. I mean, they taught it to me, and I, a lot of it's in my book. But the difference between the thing I don't like about the quote unquote pickup artist is the intention is back to our earlier conversation. It's very selfish. Mm. It's about getting what I want, mm-hmm. and and it's about the pickup artists have have a me first mentality. But some of the the techniques you say are in the book. Totally. So would you say that really what pickup artistry does is take some what could be really good productive techniques and weaponizes them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Pickup artists are way too focused on how do I get her into bed? Mm. How do I get laid? And if she enjoys it, great. But really it's about me proving that I'm the man, that I'm sexually attractive, that I'm worthy, what have you. And the difference, so, so the main difference is intentionality and, and respect for women. Mm. I have massive respect for women. I'm not just saying that to be politically correct. A hundred thousand percent. Three sisters raised me and my mom. Um, my, I mean, the four of them raised me and I like and respect women. I do not see women as pawns. Well, I kind of went down this path for a while because I work with so many PUA type guys, pickup artists, but Yeah, the PUA guy sees women as a pawn on the dating sexual chessboard. Mm. And I don't see them as pawns. I see them as uh, partners Mm. in a game we're playing together where we (laughs) we both get to win and play together as opposed to playing against each other and trying to like, you know, king the other person. So the the pickup artist, the pickup artist is basically it's about me first. It's about conquest, about lay ratio. Uh, It's about more. It's about it's about sex for ego gratification, which is ego candy. There's no nourishment there. I'm a big believer in dating, learning, growing about, learning about psychology, learning about yourself, while also pleasing a woman who wants to meet a high value, cool, authentic guy like you. And then when you find somebody you really vibe with and connect with, then you say, oh, I'm ready to drop all the dating stuff and let's let's do something really amazing. Let's um, Let's start a passionate, connected, awesome romance together and who knows where that may lead. Authenticity uh, is something I've learned can be both awesome and uh, a curse um, and something to both embrace and rein in. Where does empathy, because I know, you know, again, radical authenticity is a big part of, of what you preach. Where does empathy fit into that? Oh, it's a huge piece, mm-hmm. especially because think- I find that when I have to empathize, I also then am challenging what I may authentically or Maybe it's not authentic, but a knee-jerk reaction you impulsively want to do, which I sometimes misinterpret as why I authentically want to do. Right. Great question. I'm sorry if that doesn't make sense as a question. No, it does make sense. It does make sense. I see empathy as part and parcel with authenticity. Other than sociopaths and psychopaths, (laughs) we all have empathy. It's part of who we are. If you ask a couple of my exes, they'd be like, total sociopath. (laughs) (laughs) Thankfully, evolution has, we've evolved into being empathetic uh, an empathetic species with the rare exceptions of literally sociopaths. So empathy is not something that you need to worry about, uh, but you do need to just put it on the list of values that you have to focus on with dating because mm-hmm. think about how fragile we all are romantically, right? Most of us have a f- complex, fragile relationship with ourselves in the realm of dating and love. Mm-hmm. We're, we're very fragile. I was extremely fragile. That's why I was dry heaving in the men's room. <laughs> Because I was so fragile and I felt like one woman's rejection would mean I'm not enough and I guess I'll have to be alone or yep. 
or marry an inflatable woman. Yep. <laughs> That's scary. And so, I don't know if you saw the New York Post piece, uh, but apparently during COVID, there was one bodybuilder in the city who uh, married two. Well, that's a be- Polly. That's beautiful. Uh, he's Polly with dolls. <laughs> Polly with Swear dolls. To God. <laughs> uh, so, yes, empathy is so important. Empathy and just being aware of how somebody feels. Mm. It's not just good marketing. It's not just like, oh, be empathetic. I know that's a woke thing to say. It's also a good dating game. Mm-hmm. When a woman you're with can- sees that you're seeing how she feels, she loves that. Yeah. It tells her, oh, he's not like, just out for himself he cares about me or at least he's focused on how i feel that's sexy it really is sexy and we don't do it for the good game reasons but it's a nice dividend to like like let's say i went for a kiss and she pulled back i would totally say oh i'm, I'm sorry right. i thought you were ready for it uh my my mistake um and maybe she's uh maybe she's shy maybe she's not ready for it maybe she's not comfortable dating. I once had a date where I went for the kiss and I kind of apologized. Said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I thought you wanted a kiss. My mistake. You're beautiful, but I'll be good. I promise. And she said, oh, no, it was fine. It's just that I'm not a big PDA person. Sure. And we just exactly. waited until we got back to her place that and was the had a needed. high school makeout session. Yeah. But she really appreciated that I, I didn't like force the kiss on her. She also appreciated I apologized in a sense, but I wasn't apologizing uh, like you weren't like, like oh, acting like you murdered somebody. Exactly, you, you oh, so act funny. like you right. stepped on her pumas. You know, exactly. it was like <laughs> yeah, it was more like oh, I made you feel uncomfortable. I think yeah, and she's like, well, actually, you didn't make me feel uncomfortable. I have a PDA the situation. Thing. Yeah. yeah, if anything, she has a little rule about her herself, which is fine. That's like not kiss in public friendly. She basically let me know that, and we made out in private, which was really great. And something that's actually <laughs> helped me with those, especially when I don't, because I've I've just gotten to a point where I really don't like that egg on the face moment. So except for those moments where it's like we are we're both leaning in at the same time, one of those hmm. where it's like these inevitable things. You know, I like that. I just like to say. I mean, there's a sexy way for me to ask, but I, I go like I say something along the lines of either I really want to kiss you, or I I'd really like to, can I kiss you and. I mean that that's what the play players actually taught me yeah. was asking before little touches even if I'm at a bar and I think we're going on I want to put my hand on her thigh I'll ask now and I find that they find it re- I mean you know if you don't ask in a wussy way right it can be another fun sexy thing um and if she feels like annoyed by it then I'm like I don't even know if this is a person that would be a fit not that she's wrong for being annoyed but wouldn't be a fit for Billy and then I can you know so it's it's nice to read and um I don't know. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, I, I like that as a, an additional way to avoid the lean in. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, thing. I'm cool with either. I, I've never done what you just described, but I like it. It can be a really it's dude, it was a mind blowing thing. So at, at the play parties, uh, not that like I'm trying to teach the dating coach anything, but just this one thing was like they they, they say they really emphasize that the one I go to like ask before all touch mm. like again including the so if, you know we're like talking flirt and i want to touch your shoulder i'll i might like start reaching out and be like do you mind yeah and then like yeah and then we're like if we're talking you know the other night it was uh you know we're talking for a while and i was like i really want to kiss you and she was like yeah let's do that beautiful make it you out said it, and it then leads us downstairs and then it's like then she's like do you want to go to the basement we go to the basement and now we're fooling around more and then some things can become a little more assumed and and whatnot but at least like get some verbalization in there instead of you know i think some guys sometimes we can we we think she's so into it so we just lean in and, yeah. and maybe we've forgotten to do the empathy or to witness uh those certain cues uh but if i can ask it in a in a confident way not I as like a, that mm, can right if, if you don't mind but like i if it's okay can i you know can my lips touch yours yeah there's a way to ask it you don't want to come across like some overly chivalrous time traveling medieval mm-hmm. knight it's like may i have the moment this moment to give you a kiss my lady it's like or so weakly that like you you're asking in a way like as if you don't deserve to be kissing her right because right. that will make her feel very dry she'll be like I, I wanted to until you asked it like that <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah i love i want to kiss you mm-hmm. that's a really powerful song i've never said i don't think i've ever said that for a first kiss but that's a great way to ask without it being an ask. exactly because this, i can yeah. read the reaction and then she totally. can say i really wanted to i'm not yeah. a big pda person do you want to go to Boom. the bedroom do you want to get out of here or i can't wait till later that's or she may say i don't know if i'm feeling it yet or she might be like actually yeah this is a good time to leave 
You have just taught the dating coach, and I'm a fan. I oh, love learning. we did one. I love learning. <laughs> well, let, teach me. Uh, you have, I have in my notes, but I do not remember what it stands for. But uh, you have the ACE method. Mm, yeah. Can you tell us about that? I, it was, uh, I was curious enough, I wrote it down whatever many months ago. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a short little teaching tool, a little mnemonic device. I used to just remind clients of three of the real basics mm-hmm. of what works with women in dating. A, of course, is authenticity, which in a word is what I'm about. Showing her your real true self. What does that mean to be authentic? Hey, uh, if you think of think of the first, think of, have you ever performed on a stage? You're a stand-up comedian, yeah. right? I've done some theater, musical theater. You There's, do have a Les Mis mask up on your... <laughs> <laughs> or what, yes. Is that a Les Mis mask? It's actually... Uh, uh, is it, uh, the the one the <laughs> Macbeth show um, okay. sleep no more but close <laughs> but I I like Le Mis too um, well that's a great example so on a first date I'm totally cool with letting a woman know that I'm into musical theater yeah it's not the most masculine thing to talk about like I do jazz hands in life non ironically like I just <laughs> I'll let a woman see that side of me yeah as opposed to trying to play some part that I think she wants. I want her to know that I'm in a musical theater, that I'm a Jeopardy nerd, that I'm a dating coach, that I contain multitudes. Yeah. And so does she. We all do. And I want her to sense that complexity because it's attractive to women who like my type. And if she's not into that, I kind of want her to see that too so we can move along and find somebody better for us. So we never we want to take off that mask. So the A is for authenticity. The C is for clarity. Make it clear what you want. Hey, I want to kiss you or not. Yeah. Uh, I think that clarity, a lot of guys play it too cool with dating. They think, oh, I should be mysterious. Oh, I should. Or they don't make it clear that it's a date. Clear man to woman intention. Hey, I like you. I want to take you out on a date or I want to go out again. Um, just be clear. Guys think they need to be clever or, or, or witty or cool. No, just be clear. And by the way, in a similar way with the like, um, I want to kiss you as a way to ask without asking. I find that if I don't want to say like, I like you or would you like to go on a date? date you know, if, if I'm feeling weird about the chemistry that I want to be that way, I can give what a compliment that could only be interpreted as a compliment I would give to someone, you know, which is usually something along with like, like you're really cute or something, yeah. you know, like I'm going to give you a compliment makes it very clear that only, I'm I am interested in you sexually or romantically or whatever right. because I would otherwise never give this particular compliment. Totally. And you're doing your job as a man. A man's job, I believe, is to lead. Lead the dance. Lead the dating dance. Generally, men lead, women follow. I'm not saying women can't take the lead. I'm, I totally. love that. The ones who take the lead? Oh, that's my girl. Yeah, uh, absolutely. My, my, the people are like, Billy, you want to get married? My wife will be one who proposes. Nice. Then. <laughs> nice. But or at least early in the courtship process, we do fall into these old roles. I think these are more or less natural roles. Man, woman action reaction lead follow right so you're doing the, your job as leading by doing that so clarity just make let it let it be clear what you want how, what the frame is hey this is a story of boy meets girl this is not a friend hangout or on a date whether you, you use the word date doesn't yeah. really matter right um so clarity and then e is just expressiveness essentially the e is is how you show that authenticity express your sense of humor if you're into dad jokes like me, be, tell, your, tell your dad no, okay. jokes. Tell your dad jokes, <laughs> sure. Uh, or at least I'll be in a mood maybe where I'm in a dad joke mood. Other other nights I might express a different side of me. I might feel more sexual. Uh, Post-COVID, um, the, first, the first girl uh, who I really <laughs> vibed with, you know, 18 months in lockdown, I was horny, lonely, <laughs> sad. <laughs> <laughs> You're really, like, um, I'm the only one who's touched this for a very long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've been making out with those pillows for 18, 18 months. Uh, I was ready to make out with a real girl. And I was feeling kind of more sexual that night. Yeah. And I was just way more flirtatious and letting that side come out. And she was digging it. Um, we had our uh, my my second, third date post-COVID, but second make out was um, we made out outside this bar. And I said something about her outfit. I forget what led to this. And she said, oh, you want to see my thong? And she she's wearing a skirt, and she yeah. like showed me her thong. <laughs> like that's not a bad first date. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's as far as it went, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, but that that's she's not going to do that if I'm talking about politics and sports all night, and being really safe and saying, "So tell me more about what you like to do." Mm-hmm. It's like no, loosen up, be expressive, let that whatever, let that real personality, those real thoughts and feelings come out, 
in an organic, authentic way. Um, and that's ACE, authenticity, clarity, expressiveness. And just to, uh, I asked this short one to say what I was going to, I want to say, but you you don't consider yourself like a sex coach. You don't consider you're helping them with the, the sex part. You're like, I will no. help you with the connection. All, but so I find the ACE stuff so applicable in bed as well. Like mm. express, like expressiveness, a lot of women loved hearing me moan. I'm a moaner. I mm. will, like, I'm feeling good. You're going to hear that I feel good. Yeah. If I am quiet, it probably means I don't feel so good. Yeah. They find it so hot because I'm being expressive. Like they, 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 they know that I, they're giving me pleasure, authenticity. Right. Like if I'm trying to fuck her in a way that is not authentic to myself, not only is not going to feel good for me, she's going to sense it. And then it's just going to be not good sex. Yeah. I am not a sport fucker. I will no longer, I don't want to try to be one. Um, I'm not super kinky. And though I am like down to try things and do things in a way that's authentic for me. So like. I'm not like a dominant dude in bed, but I, I'm a lot more service oriented. Okay. But I can be dominant in this service oriented way. Some people would call it a service top. It's like I'm topping you, but because like in service to you type of thing. Right. So I can I can take charge. I can be that dommy dude you fucking love. I can be daddy. I just gotta know you like those things first. Totally. And do them. And then I can authentically do that. When I try to take that on and I've not like cleared it, it fucks with my head. I'm like, mm. oh, am I allowed? Am I allowed to do this? Does she like this? Am I am I taking on a male thing that she's like, ugh, I get, you know. So, so there's a lot in there. And and tell me what C was again. Clarity, clarity, yeah. Um, uh, that comes into consent play a lot, and totally. and or even the other night when I was with this woman and we had we've had a few dates and it was great. And I'm now finally learning what she's like in bed, and I'm at you know asking those questions like I put a hand on the back of her head, and before I pull her hair, like you like having your hair pulled. She's like, yeah. Um, and then, but then I might ask something like, do you like having your face slapped a bit? And she's like, actually, no. I'm like, great. And then I don't do that. And so I find, I, I, I like the crossover of using ACE, not just as a dating tool, but as a sex tool. Totally. I'm, I'm really, I'm really connecting and vibing with, uh, with what you literally spelled out. <laughs> totally. Nice. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but I think that it's about showing. Yeah. I think it's about showing in terms of the, um, expressiveness. Yeah. I am a big believer in letting a woman know what she's doing to you, <laughs> how it's affecting you in a positive way to make her enjoy sure. it. And that can be G-rated on the date or PG-rated on the date mm -hmm. uh, or X-rated in bed, right? So for example, on a date, one of the things I teach guys is how to flirt in a way that that's not fawning. Because mm -hmm. you can fawn over a woman and, and depolarize the attraction. Be like, So fawning is, oh my God, you're amazing. You're so gorgeous. You're incredible. I've never been with anybody like you, like that sort of vibe that puts her too high on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And that might make her feel good about how attractive she is, but it lowers your sort of standing in her eyes because all of a sudden you're just another guy fawning. You're a fan at the concert. You're not the, the lead guitarist, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, so instead, a good way to, to flirt is is showing her that she's affecting you. If you want to watch a master at this, this is the weirdest example, but it's so powerful. Go on YouTube and Google Craig Ferguson. He used to host the Late yeah. Night Show. And just look at Craig Ferguson interviewing any beautiful actress or starlet. He was so good at flirting because what he would do is he would let them know they were affecting him. Mm -hmm. But he was doing it in a classy, gentlemanly way. And obviously, he wasn't really hitting on them because he was married, as I understand it, or still is perhaps. And so, for example, Kate Mara would be on. You know, and she'd lean over and she's wearing a low top and he'd say, don't do that. It's very distracting. I'm trying to interview you. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to make this professional. Come on, Kate, stop it. Yeah. And that's a really good kind of vibe to give on a date. What are you doing? You're letting her know she's affecting you. Jump ahead to triple X rated in bed. If a woman is pleasuring you, make noises. <laughs> Let her know how incredibly good it feels. I'm not even going to be mad if you dial it up a little extra 10% just to really let her know that's still authentic. Yeah. And like, I really want her to feel good that she's doing the nicest thing a woman could ever <laughs> do for you. I think there's also a scarcity model. A lot of dudes come from that really get in our way um, in that like there are plenty of other women. The whole fish in this, there's plenty of fish in the sea. Like there fucking are. I know me though, I would hear that and I would think, yeah, but not that many fish are going to be into me. They're playing vision C. They're just, they're not interested. Mm. That was what I always thought. Okay. What, what do you say to the guy or person who is, is just having a hard time dating, is having a hard time being confident, regardless of, re honestly, like regardless of gender that they are, gender that they're into, like they're just having a hard time making those moves. They're having a hard time sending that first message. They're having a hard time walking up to that person 
at the party at the bar and just saying like hi you're really attractive my name is blank right that person to that to that person i would i would say to them if you knew that every move you make and every chance you took would be well received and go well would you feel a lot more confident would you take a lot more action the answer is almost always yes mm -hmm. which means that that man is too focused on outcome he's he's conflicted he wants the success but he's afraid of the quote unquote rejection. He's afraid that text won't come back or he's afraid the rejection will be pushed back. And that's an understandable fear, but that he has to rewire that. He has to say, wait a minute, my job as a man is to make moves, take action, take chances. Uh, action is eloquence. Shakespeare wrote one of his plays. I forget which character said it, but we have to take action as men. It's, it is eloquence. And that the rejection arguably is not even that. It's not rejection, but let's say it is. It's baked into the game. It's part of the rules. Does Tom Brady retire when he gets sacked because that linebacker was mean to him and he got sacked? No. Sacking is part of football. Yeah. It's part of the rules. Not getting a text back, getting ghosted, having a woman Please not be interested. Please tell that to the refs, by the way, is, who have to ref a Tom Brady game. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but we have to, you know, Mickey Mantle had 536 home runs. Yeah. He also struck out 1,500 times. You've got to strike out to hit those home runs. So I would tell that guy, I would say after every single chance you take, the approach, the text, the first date, find at least one thing about that date that you can appreciate, notice in a positive way. Pat yourself on the back over. What did you do well? What went well? We need to give our, our brains need rewards for, for actions we take that beyond the good result, the make out, the sex, the connection. Obviously, we, we would all enjoy that. I enjoy it as much as anybody. At the same time, when I, like that night I got blown off by the model, I said, you know what? At least I went out tonight and yep. kind of took a chance. Uh, maybe this will help me on my next date or there'll be another model and maybe I'll be in a better zone with her because, hey, I got one model blow off. Yeah. Sometimes just taking a rejection thickens your skin a little bit. Quick story I love to tell is um, I, I had a client who was a captain at West Point and a really handsome, cool, successful guy, but he felt like he just wasn't attractive to women because he's Asian. He's like, I can't meet non-Asian women. They don't want me. I'm a minority. I'm not enough because of his racial background. And he'd never approached women before. So we went to Madison Park uh, three years ago. You do these immersive ones now for your clients? Uh, I haven't been doing them since COVID, well, but I'm about but... to start again. Yeah. Okay, cool. In-person cool. coaching. Yeah, wingman yeah. coaching. Well, not in-person as in like you take, do you do the thing that mm -hmm. the coach did for you? Throw them, yep. take you in the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Under, Daytime awesome. and or nighttime, depending on well, both. Do you charge tickets to watch that? I would, I'd like to come <laughs> to the bar just to watch the whole thing go uh, down. It's so fun. It's I, so fun. I would pay for the guy's tab just yeah. so I could like observe the whole thing go down. The first post-COVID program I do where it's me, a client, or two and a couple other people definitely come out oh yes that'd be a blast um the more the merrier <laughs> so so this client and i went out and he had never approached women before mm -hmm. and i could see the sweat on his forehead as we walked into the park i've been there i've had that same sweat my forehead would be a slip and slide before i would go out <laughs> and and he you know i started pointing to oh go talk to her go talk to her he walks up to a cute girl on a blanket like a dark skinned young girl i mean not of age but a beautiful colombian exchange student gets her number meets a really attractive white girl which is what he thinks will not be into him white women wasps he was like wasps don't want to date me i'm asian i'm like well let's find out really cute pre-med wasp gives him her phone number he's like whoa this is awesome i'm really feeling it then i see another woman sitting on a park bench another wasp yeah. <laughs> and i say cool a girl on the bench Book, go over there, do your thing. He walks over, comes back about three, four minutes later, eh, maybe three minutes later, and he's got this big grin on his face. And I'm like, tell me, are we three for three? He's like, no, I got blown out, rejected. It was awesome. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because the way she did it, it was so funny. I told her I came out to look at the architecture and see the Flatiron building and she didn't even look at me. She, her nose was in the book and she's just said, well, there it is. Why don't you go look at it? And I thought that was so funny. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, your favorite approach was the one who blew you off? He said, he said, yeah. And we talked about it later. He basically said, because he realized that's what I've been afraid of all these years. 
that the rejection was going to hurt. Mm-hmm. Actually, not only did it not hurt, but he found it funny. He found the way she blew him off hilarious mm-hmm. because he realized that and, that, and that's really when the floodgates open yeah. for taking romantic chances is when you can let go of the ones that don't quote unquote go well and actually find pleasure in them and, mm-hmm. and enjoy them while still getting some good results, phone numbers, dates, yeah. then you're dangerous because there's nothing holding you back. Uh, you're Mickey Mantle. You're going to strike out sometimes, but you're also going to hit your home runs. But most guys don't even step up to the plate because they're so afraid of what that strikeout's going to feel like. And I want them to embrace that strikeout. That's part of the game. There's some guys who just need to get used to doing that, get used to getting rejections and seeing how it's probably going to be fine and okay. Yeah. Um, then I would say another level after you've established some of that, though, is what do you teach them about like appropriate situ like situations that are appropriate to go walk up to someone like and in situations where it's like be mindful that maybe that person does not want to you know for example the headphones right is the common thing we might see on a Twitter where women are like I got my headphones on and these guys are so fucking hidden on me right. I imagine that woman with the book especially once you describe what she said I was like. She 100% was just trying to read her book and yeah. some dude was interrupting her reading her book. She gave some snark. And like, it's great that like he experienced that as, yeah. oh, I went up to hit on someone. She wasn't interested. I walked away. I heard the story and I heard some dude just fucking like bothered her in the middle of reading her book in the park where she didn't display anything that suggested that she wanted someone to walk up to her. Fair so enough. what, how do you, uh, so I do appreciate what that was for him. And then, but how do you teach, you know, how to, how to tell? I would say that we need to err on the side of let's assume, let's assume a, a fighting chance of mutual interest. Mm. Let's see. Let's find out. And then if there's not, bounce. Off you go. Leave her alone. Right. But then what happens if that, like that chick in the park, I, in a vacuum, I don't see anything wrong with that situation right. too much so, right? Hey, guy just went shot, shot. And he respectfully walked away. But now what if he's the 20th dude to interrupt her reading her book that day? That was what I think prevented me from, and again, it's not like this is the right one. This is another extreme too. But like what at first prevented me from going up to girls at bars was I was like, ah, she's probably out with her friends just having a good time. I'm just like another dude interrupting her night. Now, was that entirely true? No, because the context was, these are bars. A lot of people go to bars because they want to meet people. Right. I tell myself, I have to tell myself this before I go to a sex party sometimes. Billy, it is okay to go up and just like blatantly either hit on or introduce yourself yeah because especially if a woman's here alone because even she may not be in the men and that's okay but she is at a sex party it is okay to approach people at sex parties right with sexual interests because we're at a sex party totally um yeah so a yeah like in a vacuum that there. thing is right. fine but again what if he's the 20th one to interrupt her because all their dating coaches said yeah just go to one park and be respectful when you if she's not interested yeah at some point that's that's real burdensome for her. She might she might be the kind of woman who doesn't want you to approach her. Sure. And you have to endure that if that's how she feels. She might also be the kind of woman who is open to a, a, a certain kind of man mm-hmm. doing it in a certain way. For example, I was once at Whole Foods when I was just learning all this approach stuff and I was, I was still dealing with a lot of anxiety, especially in the daytime. I got pretty comfortable going out at night because of that social permission. Yeah. Hey, they're all here. In a bar, They're drinking. They're probably looking to be talked to. Or at least it's not breaking a rule yeah. to do that. But I, it was tough for me to do this during the day. It's not the library. Exactly. Yeah. And a grocery store, the gym. And I remember meeting this woman, Ashley, in Whole Foods. And we were in, it was like out of a movie. It was like pushing our carts. And we both reached for the same box of cereal. <laughs> and all of a sudden, what? Oh, my God. Blah, blah, blah. You seem cool. And we trade numbers. And I said something to the effect of, how nice she was, how sweet and approachable she was. And she said to me, but she could have been talking to all men. She said, you know, you guys, you can just come up to us. We like it. We like it. Even here at Whole Foods. You know, I could have talked myself out of it, which I did a thousand times by saying, I don't want to bother her. She's shopping. Mm. But you know what? Once you start buying into your worth and value, you ask yourself, do you potentially have a massive value to offer that woman? Mm. Even if she's on a park bench reading her book, um, would if George, if if George Clooney was single and walked up to that woman reading a book on the bench, do you think she'd find a little time to talk to George Clooney, mm-hmm. or do you think she'd say, "Oh, leave me alone, George. I'm trying to read this book." Um, I would suggest that she, his his value, for lack of a better term, would buy him a little time. And I want men to look at themselves the same way as we're not George Clooney, we're not famous movie stars, but we are. I want a guy to to 
work on himself and move toward being a regular guy, 10. Mm. Like really work on yourself, get that confidence up, understand your value. And you know what? I, I would argue that you have more potential value to that woman than that book does. And if she says, no, thanks, I just want to read my book, say, have a nice day. It was nice meeting you. Off I go to look at the Flatiron building and I'll find somebody else who might be in a better mood or not, not that she was in a bad mood, but who might be more open to that. And you're going to get a little bit of everything. You mm-hmm. totally are. So you just, but you, you can't, again, you can't, uh, hit the home runs without a few strikeouts. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, well, Connell, where can people go to find more of you? you got this book out now. It's called uh, Dating Sucks But You Don't, The Modern Guy's Guide to Total Confidence, Romantic Connection, and Finding the Perfect Partner. Uh, plug away, good sir. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, my liege. Uh, yes, yeah, so they, can, they can get the book on Amazon, anywhere they buy books. They can also go to datingtransformation.com, mm-hmm. my website. They can get the book there. Or if you don't want to get the book, you just want to get a bunch of free stuff. I, I got lots of tips and videos on my website. And any guy who wants to chat with me about potentially working with me, I do free strategy calls, oh, intro sure. calls where we talk about how my coaching works and see to see if we're a good fit to work together. How often do those turn to accidental therapy sessions? <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone is a therapy session. Everyone is a therapy session. But also at datingtransformation.com, you can also book a call to see if we're a good fit to work together. Or you can find me at any of a number of um, play parties and sex parties <laughs> uh, where I'll be signing books and um, and looking for uh, girls who will take me into a private room because I don't know if I can do it in public, but I'll try. <laughs> that's okay. You know what I like to do? You make the connection. You don't have to fuck. I, I, that's what you meant by are there expectations. You don't have to fuck at the fuck party. You can meet someone to fuck at home in private at the fuck party. Right, I didn't know that. On Saturday night, there was someone who like she was. Vi- she kept saying like, I'm loving this vibe, but I don't know if I want to do this sex in public. So mm. after I had gone, to, conveniently after I went down on her. No, I loved it. It was fine. It was great. But then I was like, all right, cool. And then I offered. I was like, I do live nearby. Do you want to? get out of here yeah. and go somewhere more private she was like no i actually want to stay and like taking this vibe but like another time yes nice she's like i'm interested and i want to fuck you i do not want to fuck you here tonight but another time in a private place i yeah. will do uh, relationship do relationships i met i met my first this? serious post-college girlfriend at a fuck party there you go she was blowing me next to next to us was two dudes blowing each other and i was like this is love one of the biggest <laughs> myths i so i having no <laughs> one night stands till I was 38, I thought, oh, one night stands are shallow or, or like same night sex, yeah. shallow, two people who are just using each other. And then once I went out and started meeting people, uh, kind of like that, that emotional I love you night you had with that woman, even though it was just for one night and morning, I had nights like that. And some of the most romantic connected experiences I've had have been one night stands or, or short flings that were, where we did hook up that first night. And it's not necessarily a shallow thing, as long as you think about it in a win-win way. You genuinely emotionally connect and, and are empathetic. Doesn't mean you always have to have first night sex. I love going slow too. Chapter thirteen in the book is all about a, a woman I met uh, with a Me Too related past and how we we had the best sex of our lives because we waited three months until yeah. she was ready and built up. Totally, it's all about what both of you want. So. Anyway, my point is um, you, the deep relationships can begin in Vegas in the case of mm-hmm. Alex. My book is dedicated to her. Or in your case, your future girlfriend you met at a sex party. Yeah. You know, anything goes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Connell, thanks again for chatting with us. And I want you to go ahead and say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me on, Billy. Great podcast. And uh, let's go to the play party right now. <laughs> Are you enjoying some of Connell Barrett's wisdom? Well, we have a bonus episode coming out tomorrow exclusively on Patreon. Uh, This bonus episode is actually the first like 17 minutes of our last recording that ended up failing about halfway through. But in there, there's a fun story about an orgy pile at a hacienda. In there, we're talking a little bit more about his origin story. And we're talking a little bit more about confidence and approaching people you want to approach. Uh, and so if you want to gain access to that bonus episode and over 200 other bonus episodes. Seriously, people go like, oh, wow, Billy, you have like almost 400 episodes of that podcast? And I'm like, yeah, and over 200 bonus shows. I'm insane. If you can't stop hearing me talk to fun people about sex, dating, sexuality, gender, love, head on over to patreon.com slash man whore podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash man whore podcast.
You can find links to all my social media and places to find me in the show notes of this episode. Gosh, if you've ever been curious about what all this thick, soft boy juiciness looks like, it's it's available for a what I would think is a reasonable price. You would call it an affordable price. I think it's just reasonable given the content. But hey, you unlock it. You tell me how hot I am. Slip in my DMs and tell me, Pilly, fuck, you really undervalue yourself yeah that's the type of role play i like to get into when i'm sexting hey yo <laughs> i know i'm not the only one who would love for you to join us in the champagne room our super fun supportive sex positive discord server we've got multiple conversations going every day on a variety of topics from pets to books to sex toy recommendations and we even now have a new channel that's just about like pure positivity Join hundreds of whoreheads today at manwhorepod.com slash discord. And if you want to send me an email with your comments, your questions, your criticisms, you can send any and all of that over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. I'm going to toss this one out there, folks. We're, we're going to try it again. We are going to attempt this Pepsi challenge of cocksucking episode if it kills me. I don't think it's going to kill me. I just think it, it might be mildly frustrating. But if you and a partner of yours are in the greater New York City area, and if at least one of you has a penis, and if you two want to see if the other one can pick your blowjob skills out of a lineup, I need you to shoot me an email because I think we got to have you on. I think you're the couple to do this. We're accepting all gender and sexual orientation combinations. If you're two vulva having people, I am definitely open to adjusting the Pepsi challenge a little bit to accommodate your bits and pieces. Or if you are a singular female or femme identifying cocksucker and you're in the greater New York area and you would like to participate as one of our, uh, uh, what do we call them? Is that the control group? The independent variables. If you would like to be an independent variable in our experiment, you can also shoot me an email at manhorpod at gmail.com. Oh, really want to make this happen. Enjoy yourselves. Don't worry. No one's going to cut your dick off. Just stay slutty. It's the vibrator that has no equal. And now, Motor Bunny offers their thrusting sex machine, the Motor Bunny Buck. Enjoy a fan whore discount at manwhorepod.com slash motorbunny or use promo code manwhore at checkout. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, sex workers are are getting out there. I mean, there's there's a lot going on. A lot of it's really scary, um, you know, but uh, sorry, I feel like I want to start over. I'm so sorry to do that. Okay, it. great. <clears throat>